Good evening. My name is John Heron. I am the director and chief executive of the Kansas City Public Library System, and I want to both welcome and thank you for joining us on this cold and icy evening. This is a special time for the library, and we hope you'll be spending a lot more time with us in the coming year, and certainly beyond. Next week, we are celebrating the 125th anniversary of our historic Westport branch, the oldest branch in our system, and the oldest library anywhere in Kansas City. The highlight of that observance um, is next Wednesday, February 22nd, when the branch will host a public reception in the evening. Alvin Brooks, a civil rights icon in this city who has a personal attachment to Westport, um, will offer the remarks. It is a spe very special occasion, and I invite you to drop by and to share it with us. Yeah. Thank you. That sets the table for an even bigger celebration beginning next December when we mark the 150th anniversary of the, of the 1873 founding of the Kansas City Public Library. We are planning a full year of special events, remembrances, and other activities, and once again, we look forward to celebrating that occasion uh, with you. Among everything that the library offers, I take great pride, I hope you do as well, in our award-winning signature public programming. Here we are again, a community, gathered to engage in a meaningful topic to become better informed, better enlightened, and hopefully a little bit inspired. Tonight, we are privileged to do that with the world's foremost modern translator of the Hebrew Bible. We are deeply appreciative of all of our co-sponsors who have made this presentation possible. Again, thanks to all of you who have supported the library. And a special thanks to Marty Rosenberg, with whom we've worked closely on this event over the past several months. He is here to introduce our distinguished speaker. Marty is a Kansas City-based journalist who moved here with his family in 1985 to work for the Star. While there, he was a Fulbright Fellow to Japan and, among other things, covered the collapse of communism in Russia. He now hosts Grid Talk podcast for the United States Department of Energy, exploring the future of energy in a world confronted by climate change. Marty has written extensively about Jewish culture for the New York Times, The Forward, and the Times of Israel. His work has also appeared in the San Francisco Chronicle, the Japan Times, Huffington Post, and USA Today. He has been instrumental in bringing us all here together tonight. Would you please join me in giving a warm welcome to Marty Rosenberg. There are 1,500 biblical era Hebrew words or expressions in the, the Torah that occur only once. Imagine the challenge of translating them with precision and with elegance. We're here tonight with a scholar who has wrestled with that task just as Jacob once wrestled with an angel or a God. And he did it over 23 years. Robert Alter has translated all 24 books of the Hebrew Tanakh from Genesis to Ezekiel, Job to Daniel. Here is how one critic described his monumental achievement. Alter's Bible is an emphatically Jewish translation, meaning, Alter believes, resides as much in a word's poetic qualities, its music, its suggestive overtones as it does in its di dictionary uh, definition. I first sought out Robert Alter in the spring of 2021 when I needed to ask someone some big questions about life and about Judaism. It took some work tracking down the Emeritus Professor of Hebrew and Comparative Literature at the University of California in Berkeley, where he taught since 1967. But we connected, and we had the first of three 90-minute chats at Saul's on Shattuck Avenue in, in Berkeley. I came away with our, from our encounters with one thought. Had I just had coffee with the 21st century Rashi? Our conversations ranged over the Torah, Jewish commentaries through the ages, 
contemporary Israeli authors in modern literature, from Kafka to Nabokov to A.B. Yehoshua. He talked about his career, the ancient world, and the problems confronting modern Israel. Now, as a journalist, I have been fortunate to have had a handful of encounters that were deeply meaningful to me and transformative, and my conversations with Robert Alter are among them. We talked about the recent death of his wife, Carol, and at our last meeting, the passing of my wife, Matilda. I then asked him if he would be willing, at age 87, <coughs> to travel <clears throat> excuse me, to travel to Kansas City in February to honor Matilda's memory. So here we are. In the mid-1980s, Matilda and I relocated from Oregon to Kansas City to be part of a more viable and vibrant Jewish community. And 36 wonderful years ensued. We particularly loved assembling groups of our friends to study Jewish texts on Shabbat afternoons and on holidays. I know that she would have been absolutely enthralled with this evening. Many of you knew Matilda. She touched the lives of hundreds, hundreds of families in this city, many in this room, who needed special care for family members in trying circumstances. She always did it with the kindest, warmest of smiles. She was that kind of mother and that kind of wife. It is customary in Jewish tradition to spend the year after a loved one's death saying a special prayer of the Kaddish, sanctifying God's name. Tonight is a form of Kaddish for me. It is a gift that I offer back to our friends, to our community, and to our city on behalf of myself and my late wife and with the support of all the synagogues of Kansas City. We have all been stressed and changed beyond belief by COVID, the January 6th insurrection, again, a land war on the European continent, climate change, and a slow, steady, horrific coarsening of life. It is my hope that the next hour will get you past all that, inspire you, and rekindle your sense of awe. Now join me as we travel back three millennia with the esteemed Robert Alter for a fresh encounter with the Bible and Biblical Hebrew. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. This is the second time I've been in Kansas City. The first time was for a very happy occasion, which was the marriage of my wife's nephew, um, uh, um, Adam Nahum, with, uh, with Rachel Nahum. And uh, that has proved to be a blessed event. And uh, um, very happy to have such a large audience. In fact, I had my suspicions that there was a false rumor circulating in Kansas City that the topic of tonight's talk would be the chief's passing patterns. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm going to be far away from that. Now, the obvious question that anyone would ask uh, of someone who sets out to do a new translation of the entire Hebrew Bible is, um, why would you do that? I mean, th there is a canonical version of the, of the Bible, of the King James Version, and then uh, all these high-powered um, denominational committees of scholars from, with degrees from Harvard and Yale and the University of Chicago and so forth, or with Oxford and Cambridge in England, have done up-to-date translations. We don't need a new translation. Now, my 
simple answer is I won't go into the King James Version, which I admire in certain ways, but it is uh, seriously flawed, not just archaic. I think it's better than all these translations by committee done in the second half of the 20th century. So th there are two things wrong in general with these translations. I have discovered, as a translator of the Bible, that it's a, a marvelous opportunity to conduct two simultaneous love affairs with the Hebrew of the Bible and with the English language. And what I find in the modern translations is there is no love for either of those languages. I don't mean there's ignorance of those languages. Uh, there's scrupulous study uh, of uh, biblical Hebrew in the institutions that I quickly mentioned. But the Hebrew language remains an object of study and analysis, not something that gets you excited, not something that enthralls you. And you can see that in the translations. The other problem is English. Now, the King James translators were very much in touch with the literary English of the early 17th century. And it's a virtue in their rendering of scripture. The modern translators um, have a tin ear for the English language. Uh, and you find messed up idioms uh, shifting from one linguistic register or another so that, that half of a verse sounds like a government directive and another half of it like the daily newspaper and so on and so forth. So for those reasons, while I, I view the King James Version as admirable with some serious reservations, I, re, I view the modern translations as execrable. Uh, and um, I, I, might in the, I don't want to uh, linger on the faults of others, but I, I might allude to a couple of them as I go on. Now, there is, among these scholars, I'll, I'll just add one small point. Uh, among these scholars who have devoted lots of time in their professional preparation to ancient Near Eastern history, to such languages as Akkadian and Sumerian and Ugaritic and Egyptian, with, with, uh, they've focused on the findings of archaeology and so forth. Well, that's fine. It, it's quite admirable. But you will never find in any of the august institutions to which I've alluded a course on prose style in the Bible. And even uh, courses on um, the forms of literary, uh, of uh, poetry in the Bible, on the prosodic system uh, of the, the Bible. So what are the things that, in my view, a translator has to grapple with? And now, as I proceed in this, it may sound to some of you a little too literary for the Bible, because after all, the Bible, we know, is a collection of religious texts. So what does literature have to do with that? Isn't that being a kind of fanciful pursuit of a professor of literature, which is certainly a major part of my identity? Uh, what I would like to stress is that there's something fascinating and improbable about the production of the Bible, which is as follows. We all think of ancient Israel as a very important place. We talk about the glories of Solomon's temple uh, and the splendors of uh, the Israelite kingdoms. In fact, ancient Israel was a small potatoes operation. It's a narrow sliv sliver of land 
sandwiched in between vast and powerful empires. Uh, the Mesopotamian empires to the east and Egypt to the south. And if you look at what we've learned through archaeology of the material culture of these empires, ancient Israel was rudimentary by contrast. That is, uh, there's nothing in ancient Israel to compare, let's say, in architecture with the ziggurats in Babylonia or with the, the pyramids and temples in Egypt. Nothing in representational art that, that's at all in the same league as the breathtaking base reliefs of the Assyrians. So the improbable thing is that this backwards, backwoods culture produced writers of genius who uh, decided to cast their monotheistic vision in subtle, uh, extraordinarily original narratives and in uh, brilliant poetry. And this poetry and this prose narrative eclipsed everything around them uh, and uh, is among the greatest literary productions of the whole ancient Mediterranean world. And I do not know how to explain that. That is, it's a kind of miracle of cultural creativity. But given the literary gifts of the writers, they made the decision to frame their new monotheistic values in very subtle, sophisticated narratives and beautifully wrought poetry. And my contention is that if you don't honor the literary form of the poems and the narratives, you're also missing out a lot on what's being said in terms of God and humankind, creation, this the sphere of ethics and all those other things that we associate with biblical religion. So let me um, tick off with a few illustrations some of the things that a translator has to grapple with. And I say grapple with because there are problems that you're not going to solve. At least I can't solve them. You get partial solutions, compromises, which is better than nothing at all. And once in a while, you hit it bullseye uh, at the center of the, the, the target. So to begin with, if you look at the, the narrative prose, there are three prevailing levels of diction. Uh, there is a, what I would call kind of middle diction which is the language of the narrator. It is deliberately a limited vocabulary. And in the q and A, I I could explain why I'm so sure it was deliberately limited. And, and that's part of its eloquence. So that if you start popping in all sorts of fancy synonyms for the simple repetition of words in the Hebrew, you, uh, you ruin what's going on there. So that's the middle diction. It's dignified, but unpretentious, and uh, very accessible. Then there's the language of the dialogue, in which, by and large, I would say the, the speakers in the dialogues speak in a Hebrew that is correct literary Hebrew, but there are various strategies, and sometimes in the vocabulary, sometimes in the grammar, which are a kind of gesture in the direction of spoken Hebrew. Of course, since we have no tape recordings, we don't know exactly what spoken Hebrew 2,500 years ago was. Uh, we can only make wild guesses. And then there's the poetry which uses a, 
uh, specialized poetic diction. Uh, it uses some rare words, words um, that uh, sometimes so rare we're not quite sure what they mean. And um, sometimes terms that, that are uh, were probably a little bit archaic in their own time. And um, I think that um, the, this has to be um, honored in the, the translations. Uh, well, I'll, I suppose I'll, I'll give uh, one example. The introduction to the flood story in Genesis is a one-line poem. The, we don't recognize this in most of the Bibles we use, but the, the, there are many insets of a one-line poem or a two-line poem at a particularly significant or memorable point in the story. So the, um, the Hebrew, in my translation, reads like this in this one-line poem. Uh, then the, the casements of the heavens were open, and all the wellsprings of the great deep burst. Okay, the, the two half lines. Well, why casements? The, the Hebrew word is arubot, which does mean window, but it's not the ordinary Hebrew word for window. The ordinary word is halon, which appears many dozens of times in the Bible and is the modern Hebrew word for window. It's a word, if you check your concordance, that appears maybe eight times, nine times in the whole biblical corpus. And with one exception, I think, all those times it's poetry. So this relatively rare term is poetic diction. And in order to respect that, I chose a word which was um, uh, a little out of usage, a little bit archaic, uh, and you can find it in, uh, in Keats, in Shakespeare, and in other older texts in English poetry, but you won't find it in the New York Times. That is, we talk about a casement window, but it's always attached to window, and it's a particular kind of window that, that, um, that opens, you know, w with wings, spreading open. Um, so, and uh, let me add this, the archaic. Um, I thought that the, there was a certain advantage in making the Bible in English sound a little bit not of this time and place. That is, if you make it sound like the daily newspaper, it doesn't really sound lo like a sacred text that was produced 2,500 and in a few cases almost 3,000 years ago. So what I tiptoeing carefully, what I tried to do was to give a slight archaic coloration to the English without overdoing it, without over forsooth and mythink and that sort of stuff. Okay. So l l let me go down my shopping list. Besides honoring the, the three levels of diction, uh, there is um, the necessity to respect the simplicity of the, dic of the vocabulary in the narrative prose of the Bible. Instead of synonyms, the, very often, the writers use repetition. Now, we were all told in middle school that when you write your essays, boys and girls, don't repeat yourself. Find a different way to use the same, say the same thing. But that's not what they did in the Bible. They deliberately used the same word to say different things. Uh, I'll give you one example. In the story of the binding of Isaac, um, first the narrator says, and uh, I'm following my translation, and Abraham 
said to his lads, let me and the servant, let me and the lad, no, let, let me and Isaac go up and we will worship and after we will return to you. Uh, now, oh, I'm sorry, I, I got that wrong. And Abraham said to his servants, not his servants in my translation and all the others, said to his lads, let me and the lad go up and worship, and after we will return to you. So what are the two lads doing there? Well, the Hebrew word lad, na'ar, means uh, a boy, a, a young male person. It also is anybody in a position of subservience. So you can see how that fits in with, with uh, a na'ar in the sense of servants. But here's the point. It's throat catching almost that first Abraham addresses his na'arim, his servants, his lads, who may even be slaves. And then he says, let me and the lad go up. And now that same word is a term of affection. He's referring to the son, the lad, that is about, he thinks, to kill. So the, the, the two different senses of the same word pointedly clash with each other. And I think a translator has to respect that. As far as I know, I'm the only translator who, uh, uh, in both instances of Na'ar, translated it with the same word. Then there's the matter of rhythm. OK, we all know that, that poetry is supposed to be rhythmic. Uh, and I think the, the modern translators try to do that in rendering ancient Hebrew poetry, but, but not consistently or successfully for the most part. But what about narrative prose? Any good narrative prose also has rhythms, and the rhythms are significant. And I'll, I'll give you one small example from the creation story. When I sat down, and I, I was a, a total novice to translating the Bible at that time, it was my, the very first chapter of Genesis, uh, in, I came to the verse that reports the creation of the heavenly, heavenly luminaries. And I translated it without thinking that God created, and then the great light for dominion of day and the small light for dominion of night and the stars. And then I stopped and I said, why dominion of? That is, if you look at other translations, they'll say to rule over the day, to govern the day, the worst of them is the Jewish Publication Society, which says to dominate the day, which is a good example of a tin ear for English, because you uh, dominate belongs in a sentence like, in 1945, the Soviet Union dominated the smaller states uh, of Eastern Europe. It is not a, a word you would use for the relation between the sun and the day and the, and the moon and the night. So, uh, I, and at first I thought that I translated it uh, that way because the, the, um, the, it's not an infinitive in the Hebrew. It's a verbal noun, um, memshelet. But then I realized there was a more compelling reason. The Hebrew sounds like this. Etamaor, this is just half of a verse. Et ha-maor ha-gadol le-memshelet ha-yom, v'et ha-maor ha-katon le-memshelet ha-layla, v'et ha-kochavim. Now, there's a beautiful cadence there. And if you listen to my version, you'll see that I more or less replicated that cadence. The great light 
for dominion of day, the Mamshalat Hayom, and the small light for dominion of night and the stars. Now, some of you may be scratching your heads. Why is that important? That's a kind of uh, silly little thing that, that professors of literature concern themselves about. But it's not. Th that is, in great literary prose, rhythm is always meaningful. As the, the rhythms of um, Moby Dick recalling Shakespeare and Milton and the, the King James Bible are very significant. So why is this important here? Well, the, the writer of this passage, the so-called priestly writer, has a vision of creation as a beautifully choreographed sequence of events. All is harmonious in creation. And the lovely rhythm of et hamor hagadol lemem shelet hayom viet hamor hakaton lemem shelet halayla viet hakochavim communicates to the listener subliminally this beautiful order that pervades the whole process of creation. Okay, um, th then. Uh, there's the matter of syntax, word order. The, uh, first of all, a pervasive thing. In the narrative prose, the, the typical way to uh, order words is in a sequence of parallel causes connected by and. And Abraham rose in the morning and, and he, um, uh, uh, he harnessed his, his donkey, and, and he took the lad, and so on and so forth, like, and, and, and. The modern translators think, well, we don't do that in English. But actually, we do it, in, do it in English. If they had read Hemingway, if they had read K, uh, James Joyce, if they had read Cormac McCarthy in, in our own time, they would see that you can do that in English. And it's part of the literary shaping uh, of the, the, uh, the Hebrew, which gives you um, sometimes sequence of events that go in a rush from one step to the next, and the an, an, an does that. And then stately progression, which the an, an also does. A friend of mine who teaches undergraduates at Stanford told me that he was um, teaching the book of Ezekiel using uh, uh, one of the standard modern translations. As in an experiment, he took a passage from one of those translations and a passage from my translation of Ezekiel, gave them to the students and asked them to comment on the difference. And it turned out that almost all the students much preferred the parataxis, the parallel syntax of my version. They said it made the whole thing more concrete for them. So this is a kind of experimental refutation of the idea that, that modern readers can't read this kind of syntax. Then there is syntax that is um, expressively reshaped to make a point. And I, I will give you just one example. When, when Jacob's sons come back from their first journey to Egypt, they give dad the bad news that Simeon is being held hostage in Egypt, and that the man who rules over all of Egypt, of course they don't know that, that uh, it's their brother Joseph, will not see their face again unless they bring down Benjamin. And this is Jacob's response in my translation. Me, you have bereaved. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more, and Benjamin you would take. On me is all the burden. 
Now, the, you can hear that that almost sounds like poetry. It doesn't quite scan, but it comes close to it. But the big question is, what do you mean, me, uh, me, you have bereaved? I mean, the way you say this in normal English is you have bereaved me. But it's not said that way in the Hebrew. The normal way in biblical Hebrew is to say you have bereaved me, is to take the verb bereave. Uh, you don't need to put in you because uh, of um, uh, the, the way the, the, the verb is conjugated. And then you stick at the end uh, a suffix, which means me, OK? Instead of that, the writer did something remarkable. Instead of saying shikaltuni in one word, he says, oti shikaltem, me you have bereaved. Now, what's the point? Well, first, I would say that, that this is not alien to English. If you go back maybe a century and a half, that is, in English poetry until modernism, there are lots of syntactic inversions like that. Like the beginning of uh, Keats's famous sonnet, which you may have read in high school, uh, on first looking into Homer, in, in, into um, uh, uh, the translation of, of Homer, much have I traveled in the realms of gold. Now, that isn't the way you say it in, in uh, spoken English. You say, I've traveled much in the realms of gold. But Keats, for his expressive purposes, wanted to stick the much at the very beginning of the poem. And, and uh, so syntactic inversion is one of those things that gives that slight antique coloration to the language which I find to be an advantage. But why is it there? Why did the, the Hebrew writer choose this strange configuration of oti, me, she called them, you have bereaved? I think that it dramatizes the writer's sense of what I have called elsewhere um, Jacob as a prima donna of, of paternal grief. That, that is, he's at the beginning, me, you have bereaved. And then he goes on this flight of fantasy. He assumes Joseph is dead. He assumes Simeon is as good as dead. And that Benjamin will be dead if he goes down to, to Egypt. And then he ends the, the little quasi poem in, in a um, uh, almost a kind of um, envelope structure, closing structure, by saying, on me is all the burden, alai hayu kulana. So you can see that following the expressive use of the Hebrew takes you to a perception of what's going on in the story that you would not have elsewhere, elsewise. Um, OK, I, I am going to um, uh, give one short example uh, of um, uh, the um, mistakes that uh, translators make, even very learned translators, in understanding biblical Hebrew. In, I can assure you that in every translation that you have read in English of the Bible, uh, in Exodus, when God says to, to Moses that he's going to come down on Mount Sinai, he says, I am about to uh, appear before you in a thick cloud. The Hebrew is av he'anan. Now, av does not mean thick. It, the word for thick is ave. So what does av mean? Av is another word for cloud. It's a poetic word for cloud. Um, so in a way, what God is saying is something, 
I'm about to appear before you in the, the uh, thunderhead of the, of the cloud. So what's that? Well, in biblical Hebrew, also in modern Hebrew to a lesser extent, when two nouns are put together with nothing in between them, it's what scholars call the construct state. It means if the first noun is X and the second is Y, it's the X of Y. For example, the, the way you say house of David in Hebrew is Beit, which is house, and David, David. So Beit David is house of David. So there is this pattern in, in biblical Hebrew, which scholars have not recognized as far as I can tell, that when you put two synonyms together, um, what you get is an intensifying effect. That is, this is not a, an ordinary cloud, not just a thick cloud, it's a super cloud. So I translate, uh, I'm about to appear before you in the utmost cloud, giving the sense that there's something all supernatural or mythological about the, this cloud. Uh, and so you have to pay attention to these things. Um, I will, um, okay, I think that I, I'm gonna do the following. I wanna leave adequate time for your questions. So I have said nothing about dialogue so far, and I wanna give you one specimen of um, dialogue. First between God and Avimelech, and then between Abraham and Avimelech. Abraham shows up in Gerar, identified as a Philistine town, which is an anachronism because the Philistines had not yet arrived in ancient Palestine. Um, and um, he passes Sarah off, many of you will remember, as his wife, as his sister. Uh, Abimelech takes her into his harem. She's a beautiful woman, we're told. Uh, but he does not have sex with her, uh, at least not that first night. And God appears to him in a dream and says, um, you are a dead man because of the woman you took, for she is another's wife. Uh, and uh, the, uh, I, I didn't quite get, get it as far as the Hebrew went. The Hebrew is just two words, hincha meit. You're dead. But I thought that was a little too colloquial or whatever. So I said, you're a dead man, um, which is not a way you like to, to be greeted by God. <laughs> and then Avimelech is aghast. And um, he says, um, my Lord, will you slay a nation even if innocent? Which is weird but I reproduce it literally. And the weirdness, I think, has to do with the fact that the story is alluding to the previous episode, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. That, that is, the la will you slay a nation even if innocent? You remember um, Lot's, uh, I'm sorry, Abraham's bargaining with, with God if there are 10 men, innocent men in the city. But the same vocabulary is used. Um, and uh, so the next, I'm gonna skip down to the last part of, of uh, the, uh, the dialogue. Uh, the next morning, um, he summons Abraham, Avimelech summons Abraham, and Avimelech called to Abraham and said to him, what have you done to, me, to us? And how have I offended you that you should bring upon me and my kingdom so great an offense? Things that should not uh, be done, you have done to me. So he's indignant. He's really outraged, which one understands, passing off his wife uh, as his sister. And um, 
And Abimelech said to Abraham, what did, you imagine, what did you imagine when you did this thing? Now, I'll give you a little tip about dialogue in the Bible. There's one set way to introduce the speech of characters, which is, and Reuben said to Simeon, and then you have a Reuben's speech. And then what will follow is an, uh, Simeon answered and said, and then you have Simeon's response. But there is another pattern that shows up, I don't know, 20, 30 times, in which you have, and Reuben said to Simeon, he speaks, and then again the, the formula for introducing speech, and Reuben said to Simeon. In all those cases that I've encountered, that is an indication that the second party in the dialogue has a problem responding. Either he's dismayed or abashed or astonished or whatever. And, and I think that's a clue to us here, that Abraham at first uh, doesn't know how to respond. And uh, at that point, we have um, Abraham does respond, that is, he's got his wits together, and he says, For I thought there is surely no fear of God in this place, and they will kill me because of wife, my wife. And in point of fact, she is my sister, my father's daughter, though not my mother's daughter, and she became my wife. Now, there, there's a lot of scholarly debate uh, on what he's actually arguing here. I think it's a verbal smokescreen. And uh, the, the tip for me was the word I translated as in point of fact. That is, the Hebrew is omna, not with a, a mem at the end, omna. And uh, it's a rare word which I conclude is a kind of legalism. So, um, Abraham is kind of um, uh, confusing the, the, the adversary in court uh, and do, doing the, the, this ledger domain uh, about father's daughter, mother's daughter, and so forth. And um, I told her, this is the kindness you can do for me in every place to which we come. Save me, he is my brother. And uh, they go on in the dialogue. I'm going to skip down to, to the uh, last part of it. Um, well, I think I, I will, that my pages are sticking together, so I will uh, quote fr from memory. When Abraham explains how it is he adopted this peculiar strategy of um, uh, a, calling Sarah his sister, not his wife, he begins the explanation by saying, you're about to hear a translation that nobody else uh, ever did. And it happened when the gods made me a wanderer. Now, ev the, the word for the God that I've translated for the gods is Elohim which you probably, most of you know, is the standard word for God, with a capital G in uh, the Bible. It has a peculiarity, which a few of you may know, which it has, the word shows a masculine plural ending, im. Like, you know, you, you say yelled, boy, and the plural is yila dim, him, right? Uh, but it's treated as grammatically as a singular. The, 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 that is, uh, if there's a verb that Elohim is the subject of, that, uh, that verb is conjugated in the singular, not in the plural. So why, why this 
linguistic anomaly exists is hard to say. Uh, my guess is that uh, it's a linguistic fossil. Th that is, Elohim used to be a current term in, in ancient Hebrew for the gods. And then when they became monotheists, they carried it over without changing the form of the plural. That, that's why I, I call it a linguistic fossil. But, and here's a big but, uh, in a couple of cases, uh, I'm, I call to mind at the moment just two, Elohim is treated as, as, um, as a plural grammatically. Uh, one famous instance is the golden calf story. When Aaron addresses the people, he says, using plural forms, Elu Elohecha Yisrael asher hotziucha mimisraim. These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land, out of Egypt. And here, Abraham uses a plural form. He says, Vayihi, and it happened, Ka'asher uh, hituni Elohim. The word that means made, made a wanderer, hitu is a plural form, as those of you who have even a smattering of Hebrew grammar will know. So what's going on? Why the plural form, which led me to uh, render this uh, as, um, uh, uh, as the gods? Well, think of the situation. Abraham is speaking to a polytheist. And um, he doesn't want to confuse him. He doesn't want to give him the, the impression that, that there is one and only God who uh, imposed on him the destiny of wandering. <coughs> so he says, the gods. It doesn't make Abraham a polytheist because it might well be just a manner of speaking. That, that is, to refer to El Elohim in the plural is a little bit like saying uh, destiny, fate, circumstances made me a wanderer. So for me, it's a, a beautiful illustration of how the dialogue is modulated to fit not only the speaker, but also the, um, the person who's being addressed in, in the dialogue. And uh, I find that again and again, and it's part of the uh, subtlety of biblical narrative, but also, uh, I would say, um, start uh, part of the, um, let's call it the position in the situation and in life of the speaker in the dialogue. That, that is, Abraham is aware he's speaking to a polytheist, so okay, let, let, let's kind of lean over a little bit uh, and give him a locution that, that won't challenge his preconceptions and that is okay for uh, a polytheist. So what I, I would say in general, is that as you read biblical uh, uh, narrative and, and biblical poetry, okay, I, I really have neglected poetry, so I'll take three minutes with, with a, one example from poetry, and, and then I, I will conclude. Um, psalm 30 the, is a Thanksgiving psalm, evidently spoken by someone who had been in a near fatal illness and then w recovered. So he thanks God for rescuing him. And in the course of this poem, he recalls the prayer he uh, recited to God in desperation during his illness. 
And he says, in all the translations, beginning with the King James, um, what profit is there in my blood? Or in the moderns say, what profit is there in my death? Thinking that, that modern readers can't understand the metaphor. Um, in my, in uh, my descent to the pit or something like that in the second half. Now, uh, what profit is in my blood does not sound like a line of poetry. You hear that it has no rhythm. And it occurred to me that in translating biblical poetry, if you get rid of unnecessary words, you can get the right ryth rhythm. And so it dawned on me that you don't need the is there, which actually is not in the Hebrew. It's only implied. So if you translate what prophet in my blood, you get exactly the rhythm of the Hebrew, ma betza bidami. So uh, you can't always solve problems so neatly. Uh, and uh, I'll be the first to admit that translating great works is an endless process of compromises. Some of the compromises are happy compromises. Some of them are a little awkward or even painful. But what I've done is to make every effort to come up with, with good compromises, or even with instances where no compromise is necessary, but just uh, hitting the target. And my contention is that by getting a lot closer to the, the beauty, the purposefulness, the subtlety of the literary formation of narrative prose and then of poetry in the Bible, we come much closer to the religious vision of the, these extraordinary writers. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. The first question I want to ask you about is um, the head of a Hebrew academy, the Chaim Rembrandt Hebrew Academy is here. Virtually every rabbi in Kansas City is here or listening in. You've told me a story about how post bar mitzvah, you had an experience growing up in Albany where you managed to fall in love with Hebrew. So tell these rabbis and school administrators, what they could do to produce the, the Robert Alters of the next 30, 40, 50 years? <laughs> well, let me say this. The, the problem was making my experience paradigmatic for instruction of American kids in Hebrew is that I am a language addict. Uh, I get high on language. That's why I became a professor of literature. But you also were playing football and yeah, running playing, track. Right, I was doing that. So yeah. how, did, how did the Hebrew grab you? Well, I, as a, it had something to do with my addiction to language. When after my bar mitzvah, um, the pre-bar mitzvah education was worthless. Uh, <laughs> When I, well, we're all familiar with that phenomenon. Um, I was, I enrolled in a small class created for bar mitzvah and post bar, bar mitzvah boys. And the language was taught seriously as a language. We learned to listen to and understand the language. And then uh, we had a teacher who introduced us to the mysteries of it, it, classical Hebrew grammar and its connections with other languages in the ancient Near East. And I found that fa fascinating, so I, I got hooked on it. 
So I, I asked several of the rabbis to uh, plant some questions to get our, our conversation rolling. And Rabbi Griscott of Kehillath Israel wants to ask you this question. Do you think that traditional Orthodox faith in the Torah's divinity and infallibility is still tenable in light of modern scholarship? Uh, that's a hard one. Uh, I would say infall infallibility is, is not tenable because um, you see that, that there are all kinds of evidence in the way the texts are written that these were created by human beings. I don't negate the possibility that the human beings were inspired by God or at least felt they were inspired by God, but that doesn't mean that, that they took dictation from above. And um, uh, let's see, what was the other part of your question? Whether it's still um, tenable, the divinity and infallibility in light of modern scholarship. Yeah, so the, there, there are many things in the Bible that, well, there, there are contradictions. Contradictions because different sources uh, are incorporated. Now, there are ingenious ways to harmonize those, but not very convincing. For example, we all know the story of David and Goliath. But at the end of 2 Samuel, the killing of Goliath is attributed to somebody entirely different from David. So that can't make it, that, that doesn't qualify as an infa infallible text. One or the other is wrong, right? Um, so the, the infallible part, I think, ha has to go by, by the wayside. And I can't sort of turn off that switch in my head. Um, as I said, uh, well, let me take the instance of prophecy. The, many of the prophecies begin with, thus said the Lord, ko amar Adonai or nu'um Adonai. And uh, I would assume that Isaiah or Jeremiah uh, believed that they, they heard God speaking. But they weren't taking down God's words. They were, especially Isaiah was composing poems which used the, the artifice of poetry to convey what Isaiah was fully convinced was God's compelling message. So <clears throat> I, I would like to read you a few sentences from towards the end of the art of the biblical narrative to suggest what your vision might be of how a closer appreciation of the, the meaning of the language of the Torah can lead to deeper faith. It has been my own experience in making a sustained effort to understand biblical narrative better that such learning is pleasurable rather than arduous as one discovers how to adjust the fine focus of those liter literary binoculars, the biblical tales, forceful enough to begin with, show a surprising subtlety and inventiveness of detail, and in many instances, a beautifully interwoven wholeness. The human figures that move through the landscape thus seem livelier, more complicated, and various than one's preconceptions might have allowed. Talk about that and how your work has, how you've embraced your work in terms of your own spirituality and how you view the tradition and how you live the tradition. I mean, from that statement, how, how do I do view Jewish tradition? Yeah. Well, Jewish tradition, which spans about 2,000 years, uh, is 
very variegated. Uh, I mean, um, what goes on in the, the uh, in the, the midrashic reading of the Bible is very different from what goes on in Maimonides' reading of the Bible. And I celebrate the, the variety of, of Jewish tradition, and some of it speaks more directly to me than other parts of it. Um, say the, the Midrash, um, even though there are certain assumptions about the Bible that I don't um, share, has, uh, offers many brilliant insights into what's going on in the biblical texts. Uh, and uh, maybe because I'm, I'm not a big rationalist or an Aristotelian, Maimonides speaks less to me. That's to me. I know he's very meaningful to a, a lot of uh, contemporary Jewish thinkers. Rabbi Mark Levin has this question. How do you evaluate the biblical literacy of the American Jewish community and the Israeli Jewish community? Ah. Well, uh, the, the biblical liter literacy of the American Jewish community is very low. Let's be realistic. I would say that people who attend services every Shabbat may at least be familiar with, with um, the Torah because they, they hear it read every week year after year, uh, w whether they, they, uh, they know much about Kohelet Ecclesiastes or about Proverbs or, or uh, about the Book of Kings, uh, I would be skeptical. In Israel, um, there certainly is still more biblical literacy than there is in uh, America, partly because Israelis, after all, can uh, read the biblical texts in their original language. It used to be very central in the school curriculum. It's less so now. So I, I would say that, that uh, the, the biblical literacy has been somewhat eroded in Israel. It's hard to evaluate. But uh, or quantify, let's say, but uh, is not entirely gone. Do we have any questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Um, um, uh, Dr. Alter, do you believe that the Bible is divinely inspired or divinely written or neither or something else? Well, that, that comes close to a question that, that I already answered. Um, I certainly for the, the reasons that I, I've indicated, do not believe that it was divinely written. These are human productions. Um, they're human productions which, in most cases, well, not, not in all biblical cases, um, claim to be divinely inspired. And that's something uh, I, I would, for me personally, the jury is still out. In other words, um, uh, given a person's belief commitments, he or she could uh, firmly embrace the idea that the Bible is divinely inspired. Or you could also raise the question, well, parts of the Bible maybe, and not other parts. 
Um, like the book of Judges is full of stories of uh, mayhem and rape and mass murder. And is that divinely inspired? I'm not so sure. Uh, but it, it would be uh, a call made by the individual believer or non-believer, whether it's divinely inspired. Right. Sir, please. Uh, thank you for your talk, Dr. Alter. Um, in your introduction to your Hebrew Bible translation, you discuss the heresy of explanation, where translators frequently will translate concrete and bodily language in Hebrew literally and abstractly in English. Why is identifying and preserving the concrete embodied language of Hebrew significant and meaningful for readers of the Bible? Oh, repeat the last sentence. Why is preserving, identifying and preserving the concrete embodied language of Hebrew significant for readers of the Bible? Okay, uh, there are a couple of reasons. One is concreteness makes possible um, multiple meanings, which Jewish tradition, of course, has always insisted on in the way the Bible uh, conveys uh, significance. So, for example, if you take a metaphor and you, ele uh, maybe the word is elevated or reduce it, yeah, reduce it, to an abstraction that you think it refers to, you're taking away from the multiplicity of meanings uh, of uh, the Hebrew. For example, in Kohelet, Ecclesiastes, there is this refrain that everything is hevel, havel, havanim, ha havalim. Now, um, the translations before me all said, well, the King James says vanity of vanities in the old Latin sense of vanitas. Uh, the moderns translated as um, absurdity, futility, and so forth. The Hebrew is a concrete metaphor. It's um, uh, mere breath, merest breath. All is mere breath which is wonderfully evocative because breath comes out of your mouth, it dissipates in the air, and there's, it's not there anymore. There's no substance to it. So mere breath is not just futility, it's futility, it's insubstantiality, it's ephemerality, and so on and so forth. So the, uh, the wonderfulness uh, of the, the, the Bible is partly in the concreteness of its metaphors. Um, okay, I'll let that stand there. Okay, go ahead, sir, and then we'll take one more from YouTube and call it a night. Actually, I'm gonna preempt that YouTube. And I oh, sure. Say, okay, go ahead. You talked about the Bible being written over a period of time by different authors. Could you talk a little bit about some of the challenges that presents to an interpreter that's trying to create a full accounting of all these books? Well, now let me give you the time frame. The Bible basically is an anthology, an anthology with different authors, written at different times. The oldest text, which is probably the Song of Deborah, uh, Judges 5, probably goes back to the year 1100 before the, the Common Era. The latest text is um, the book of Daniel. There's a certain reason because uh, of uh, a prophecy that has a date to it that we know when it was written. And that's around 165 BCE. So we're looking at a span of over 900 years. And of course, the language changes, and any language would change over 900 years. Um, there is um, what scholars call classical Hebrew, in which, say, Genesis, 
the book of Samuel and so forth were written, and then what they call late biblical Hebrew, where the syntax is different, where some of the, the terms used are different, you begin to see a, an influence of the um, Aramaic, which was coming in, into use in speech and the population uh, of um, uh, ancient Israel. And uh, so you don't want to translate the book of Daniel or um, Jonah, say, exactly the same way you translate Genesis. But it's tricky to do it authentically because the evolution of English, say from Chaucer to um, Philip Roth, is, um, is a very different kind of evolution. It's not a neatly analogous one. So it is customary in the Jewish faith when there is study of words of Torah in conjunction with a memorial that a Kaddish be said, which is a sanctification prayer. And I'm now going to recite it right before we adjourn in, memor in memorial to Mazel Bat Simcha. Yikadal v'yikadash merabah v'yamad yivrach yutei v'amlich malkutei v'chayechon v'yamechon v'chayet d'chol be Yisrael v'agala v'zman kariv v'yimra amen v'yish merabah mevorach v'yom amen amaya Yiprak, Vishtabak, Vipar, Viraman, Vinase, Visadar, Vita Alev, Italal, Shame de Kurisha, Brihu, Vailam and Kobekata, Vishirata, Tishbakata, Vinakamata, Tamiram, Bioma, Vimro, Amen. Yehe Shalom Rabam and Shemaya of Haimaleno, Vyako Israel, Vimro, Amen. Ose Shalom Bramamov, Huyase Shalom, Oleno Vyako Israel, Vimro, Amen. Amen. Please join me in thanking Robert Alter for joining us tonight. If, thank you all for coming tonight. And if you have a book you would like Dr. Alter to sign, please line up over here behind me.